so much of the anger out there right now is directed at fellow Americans who voted away that you find repugnant. I went on the internet. I looked everywhere. I was reading the, the comments, and they're so hateful and spiteful, and, and there are no doors open to working with anybody, and it's, it's, it's... Folks, the anger that I'm reading online is poisonous. It's poisonous. What kind of country are you going to have with this long term? And the worst part is it solves nothing. Being angry to the point of, you know, fist fights with other people who are your countrymen solves nothing and divides us more. How about we unite over something that we can all agree on and push for that before the next time comes up when we have presidential choices we can't stand? What I would say to these people that are so angry, that the people that voted the wrong way, whichever way that may be, is that your anger is misdirected. Most of those people, isn't this interesting, but most of those people, given another option, would have taken it. Someone from their own party especially. They didn't enthusiastically support the candidate. You're holding them accountable for holding their nose and voting for what they saw as the lesser of two evils. We could all be working together to see that we come up with a way that we don't have to vote for the lesser of two evils anymore. But in order to do that, you have to take on the current system we have. Now remember, this is not a system designed in the Constitution. These two parties are not a part of the government. These are private entities and yet they control access to who gets the White House, and they continually give us people we don't like and who don't follow through with their promises. Do we have to stand for that? You can get mad at your countrymen for voting wrong, but even if he voted the other way, the country's not doing that great. Well, what kind of changes could we make, Dan? Well, listen, they're long shots, but they're the kind of thing that become possible in times that are extraordinary, as we said earlier in this conversation. It's extraordinary times. You have to take your blinders off and say, well, that would never happen because something that just happened is something that never could have happened. President-elect Trump is president-elect, right? All bets are off. Shoot for the moon. What do you got to lose? You know, things seem to be on a roll that way right now. It might be a sign of the times, don't you think? Radical thinking starts to make sense when times become radical. I mean, for example... If my numbers are right, and they may not be, I think Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, and of course she lost the Electoral College. That's not that unusual. But once again, we're left asking whether or not the Electoral College really makes sense in the modern 21st century world. Shouldn't we just be going on who gets the most votes? And you think to yourself, well, that's a really tough thing to change. Yeah, times might have to be really unusual to get that changed. Bing. Okay, there's one thing maybe you could think of. What about the idea that would turn the lesser of two evil argument totally on its head. We, we mentioned none of the above in a show or two ago, which, by the way, Nevada has. That's not that unbelievable. I mean, we have a state that actually does that. But how about preference voting? A lot of people like this idea where you rank your choices. And that way you can always say, well, listen, if Bernie Sanders doesn't get in, uh, I want my vote to go to Hillary Clinton. But if I can vote for both of them, I, I want Ber Bernie more. That is a thing right there that completely revolutionizes the system. Usually you can't imagine a change that big happening. We live in interesting times, though, don't we? So when I see protesters out in the street, as I did last night on all the news stations, and I wondered what they were protesting for. I mean, I'm glad they're out there. Maybe they're just getting their protesting muscles warmed up, teaching the youngins how to do it. Always good to get into shape for that. I get it. I'm pro-protest. But I kept wondering what they wanted other than to, to show how upset they were about things. If you want to protest for something and maybe something you can get, you know, conservative people on the other side of the ledger to agree with you on is let's start talking about ways so we don't have to vote for the lesser of two evils forever. Because as I think you can tell, because it's pretty common sense, isn't it? That eventually you end up at the same destination, no matter how slowly or quickly you know, your voting takes you there, right? An evil destination one way or the other. Let's fix what's broken here. You're not going to fix the voting patterns of your countrymen, but you might fix the system that gives them such poor choices to make as well. 
Now, I do want to point out how deliciously joyful it is to read columns like the one I read by David Brooks yesterday. And I'm amazed that David Brooks, who I saw on television as an analyst working the election till like three in the morning, I don't know how he got home, penned this article, and got it at the New York Times the next day, but he did. And of course, you know, he being an insider to the elite Beltway sort of a group, I mean, he's appalled at the whole thing. But then he wrote this. Now, I can always count on David Brooks to shoot down the idea of third parties and independence because it's, you know, there's too many uh, uh, systemic roadblocks and you're just dreaming. Pick one of the, the two parties and like everybody else. But of course, now that he doesn't really have a party, he likes third parties. Uh, he wrote this from the middle of the piece, quote, Personally, I've always disdained talk of a third party, mostly because the structural barriers against such parties are so high, no matter how scintillatingly attractive they seem in theory. But it's becoming clear that the need for a third party outweighs even the very real barriers. The Republican Party, he writes, will probably remain the white working class party, favoring closed trade, closed borders, and American withdrawal abroad. The Democratic Party, meanwhile, is increasingly dominated by its left-slash-Sanders wing, which offers its own populism of the left. There has to be a party for those who are now homeless, he writes. There has to be a party as confidently opposed to populism as populists are in favor of it. End quote. Well, David, I'm glad you've seen the light. All you had to do was not have a party to vote for before you started seeing how much you liked the idea of a third party or an independent candidate. Maybe you could call your third party the Federalists or Optimates. Finally, let me throw in a little side benefit to all this. And I don't know if you're going to like to hear this or not. There's a dynamic that we've talked about on this program before. The dynamic involves holding a president accountable for something if that president is a member of your own party. I mean, I'm actually excited about Donald Trump being president in one sense because all of a sudden I can gain back all these allies who were Democratic Party candidate supporters on constitutional civil liberties questions and such. I mean, when Barack Obama did things with drones, that those same folks would have torn George W. Bush apart for doing they often sat on their hands because they didn't want to undercut their president. Now, that is certainly not something that is unique to Democrats. It's a human thing. Republicans do it, too. You don't want to undercut your guy, so you mute your criticism sometimes, even if it's something you feel strongly about. Well, some of the greatest defenders in this country of these civil liberties causes that are important to me, you know, align with the Democrats. They have been too quiet for two terms it will be nice to have them back on my side. So I know you're angry. I know the Trump supporters were angry too. I mean, this was an angry election. It's an angry result. But let's use this anger. And I'm Trump supporters, you people too, because you're going to be pretty mad if he starts Giuliani-ing and gingrifying his, uh, his policies all of a sudden and starts looking like you voted for Marco Rubio. When that happens and you're mad... Realize that the only people that can really help you are the people that voted the other way two nights ago. The reason you should not misdirect your anger at your countrymen is because if we're going to solve these problems, we need each other. I know that's a radical thing to say nowadays, right? The idea that you could work with the fellow Americans, the people that you're each calling each other such horrible names on the Internet right now. But unless this secession move in a place like California or something comes off, we're stuck with each other. There's some things we can change if you're willing to reach across the divide. And if you find it hard in this post-election season with the wounds still fresh and everybody so upset with their fellow man to think about working in tandem with them for any collective goal, bear in mind that a great many of the people who voted the way that you can't stand that they did wouldn't have voted that way if they weren't stuck in this lesser of two evils dynamic as well. A lofty but doable goal for the next four years would be to see if we couldn't figure out a way and enact changes 
so that none of us ever had to do that again. That makes this country better and helps all of us. And that ought to be the criteria we move forward with whatever we're talking about.